Hi, everyone. This is Ashley Latecki Ellenboss with Sky House Herb School and Apothecary. And today I am joined by Dr. Judith Shamash, who has just published a wonderful book that I think you will all be very interested in. Welcome, Dr. Judith. Thank you. It's so wonderful to be here. So we'll be talking about her new book called The Physics and Poetry of Eastern Herbal Medicine. And these are three topics that I think you as my listeners will be really interested in. And she does an amazing job weaving these together in her book. So let me tell you a little bit first about Dr. Judith, and then we will dive into some questions about this wonderful text that she's published. So Dr. Judith Shamash, PhD, systems herbalist, has been a clinical practitioner since 1994. Found Founder of Green Fingers Herbal Medicine Clinic, she practices Ayurvedic, classical Chinese, and Western herbal medicines and teaches apprentices. She has served on the governing council of the American Herbalist Guild, Arizona Herb Association, and Rain Star University College of Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine, and has been adjunct faculty of the Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine. A yoga instructor and poet, she was also an assistant curator for the Phoenix Art Museum and worked in geology and archaeology. So thank you again and welcome, Judith. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you, Ashley. Wonderful to be here. Good. Well, you have quite the background, you know, I mean, yoga, the study of all these different forms of Eastern medicine, physics. So, um, gosh, I just was so intrigued when I saw, you know, when, when um, I received a copy of your ebook and I just was like, I would love to talk with her more about how she came into these different subjects and then kind of how you brought them all together. So can you tell us a little bit about your background and how did you come to know these three fields of study, poetry, physics, and Eastern herbal medicine? Well, I was a science major in high school and a science major in college and I actually studied to be a research scientist. So I did that for a number of years. I was in geology. My actual expertise was in oceanography, but I never got an opportunity to do that. And then after that, um, I went into herbal medicine. It was something I've always been interested in taking care of my own family, taking care of my own health rather than go, going to doctors, medical doctors. So, and fortunately we were blessed. My family was blessed with um, very good health. So we rarely, if ever went to doctor. And so I, I sort of segued into herbal medicine and began studying it actually in 1974. And I, from there, I just got my hands on everything I could read and studied everything I could find on herbal medicine. Back then, there wasn't a whole lot, by the way. <laughs> and so I began practicing it. And um, but after about oh, 15 years or so, I became kind of dissatisfied with it because it, it didn't have a methodology and I was getting irregular results. So, but I still used it for my family. I certainly brought my daughter up with that or herbal medicine. She actually never went to a doctor um, till she was on her own. And then I went from herbal medicine to Eastern herbal medicine after I went to a lecture by Deepak Chopra, who introduced me to Ayurveda. And I thought, oh my gosh, Ayurveda has that missing link I was looking for that made my scientific mind a lot happier to um, begin studying it. So I began as soon as I, well, actually, almost as soon as I got home, I looked up the Ayurvedic Institute and, and um, Michael Tierra's, um, on uh, his long distance course. Well, we actually had to be there a couple of times. And I started studying Eastern medicine and I enjoyed studying both at the same time. Um, then I went from there after I'd been practicing for a number of years, I began to realize that quantum physics spoke of, uh, and my reading is very eclectic, so I'm all over the board with my reading. So when I was reading about quantum physics, I realized, oh, wow, they talk about things the same way Eastern medicine does. And so um, in a very poetic way, and I thought, this is really interesting. So um, 
that's how I got from physics to Eastern medicine. And the poetry part came in when I was in, oh, I would say about 10 years into my practice of Eastern medicines and realized that they were so beautiful and they they were just so poetic in the way they operated it uh, operated and so i just started writing poetry and the first poetry i ever wrote i believe was on the five elements i know them as the five phases that's how i refer to them in the book but the five elements and then that led me back again into the physics and just kind of combining these things all together and realizing wow there's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> <laughs> ah, we're just rediscovering the old old things, right? Absolutely. Ayurveda is 5,000 or more years old, and it's just a rediscovery. Quantum physics is just a rediscovery of what Ayurveda has always known. Mm. So yeah, I want to I wanna hear more about that. So let's just dive into that. What, what is it? Tell us a little bit about what you learned about physics and what are some examples of that connection? Well, let's see, the examples of the connection, there's always that description um, when, when physicists try to describe what their experiments mean, there is no scientific language for it because, they're, because it's an experiential thing. So physics has found that we as people are the observers of the experiment. And in doing the observing of the experiment and what goes on, we're actually influencing it. And Ayurveda has known that all along. So we actually, as physicians, we influence the patient. We cannot be separate from the patient. And that's what physics has more recently discovered is that, wow, we can't divorce. We are what we observe. We we just des- we we design what we observe. Mm-hmm. So, um, but Ayurveda has always known that. Wow! Yeah, that's pretty amazing. So, so how how does this become useful, like in in a practice or in a more clinical setting? This knowledge. Well, my in my opinion, and the way I was taught by Dr. Ladd at the Ayurvedic Institute was that the physician is very much a part of the healing process of the client. So when you work with a client, you actually, and this is a term from physics, quantum physics, you entangle, you enmesh with the client. And there's a part of you that literally helps that client. So we have a duty as as healers to, to bring that to the client. We cannot be separate from the client. We cannot just read reports, lab reports that are numbers. And and in some cases, most doctors don't even look at the patient. They just look at the lab reports. And and that that creates a wall between, at least in the physician's mind, between them and the patient. That's not possible. We are, they are part of the healing process. Mm. And so Ayurveda and traditional Chinese medicine acknowledge and own that as part of the therapeutics. That's, that's what they're all about. That's what Um, they're all about. It's so basic to, to Eastern medicine. Yeah. And I think it's quite beautiful to have that opportunity to help someone heal. Mm. Yeah. And, and so what is the, you know, what happens because in the West as practitioners, many of us are trained that we're not supposed to become enmeshed, entangled with our clients, that we're supposed to be, uh, you know, yeah, like a more, more of a bystander and just a, sort of a, a, an educator, but not really an influencer. So what effect has that had for us culturally, do you think? Well, I feel that has definitely culturally, well, we're living with the results of what we've created here, (laughs) which is kind of a disaster. But um, culturally, it's, it's, there is no divorcing from nature. There is, you can, you are, we are part of nature. We cannot separate ourselves from nature and what goes on 
outside of us because what goes on outside of us is the same thing that goes on inside of us. So our environment is a reflection of what is happening inside. Mm -hmm. Now, does that put extra pressure on the practitioner? Extra pressure. I, I feel it's a responsibility, but I think as a practitioner, you have a responsibility to your patient or your client. And otherwise, maybe you should be doing something else. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, because as an agent, if you're part of that healing process, if you yourself are not engaged in larger cosmological forces, right, then you might not be aware of what medicine you're actually giving. So does does so true. Does the, so do the, do the traditions of Ayurveda, cause I was trained in Western herbal medicine. I've dabbled a little bit in Ayurveda and Chinese medicine just from my schooling. Um, but is there, is there like a, an emphasis in Chinese medicine and in Ayurveda on the cultivation of the inner world or the inner sphere as a practitioner? Well, Ayurveda is the science of life. That's the meaning of the term Ayurveda. So in Ayurveda, we're very um, aware that we need to help the patient change the lifestyle that created the problem in the first place. So yes, so by all means, we, we do have that responsibility to help that client not only heal the what is ever, whatever is imbalanced in the, or unbalanced in the client or patient, but we also have the responsibility to counsel them to not make that mistake again. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah. And the way I do that is I, I try to explain to the client, um, or in some cases, if you were an acupuncturist, licensed acupuncture, it would be your patient. Um, I try to explain to the client in ways that they can understand what is happening in their system. The way I do that is I I talk about the weather or the climate. And because the macrocosm, the climate, the outside world is the same as the microclimate, the inside world. So we can talk about the hot, cold, wet, dry, windy conditions outside in our environment as climates And we can talk about them the same way inside the body. So, for example, if you were in the northwest part of the USA, say Seattle, you're going to be dealing with Seattle weather. And that feels cold and damp, uh, generally. So we can have that same cold and damp accumulate in the body and actually invade the body, depending on your lifestyle and how strong your system is. So it can actually invade the body and accumulate. When it, when it accumulates, which by the way, it becomes dosha <laughs> or mistake. That's what dosha means. Um, so when it accumulates, it actually creates um, a disease pattern. And that disease pattern, for example, a cold and damp disease pattern is in Western medicine, similar to what they would call arthritis. So what we do is we go into the system with herbal medicine and we use the herbal medicine that counteracts that cold and damp climate internally to get rid of it and and move it out of the system. So, um, for example, we can also say like the Southwest where, where I live is hot and dry. So we see a lot of hot and dry patterns happening in this climate. Um, so we would use herbs to counteract that. In the, if you lived in the Southeast part of the country where it's damp and humid, I mean, humid and hot, rather, sorry. Um, We would use herbs to counteract that. Mm. So we use what Eastern medicine uses, what we see in the world to describe what happens inside of us because we're made of the same stuff. We're no different. 
We are, we are exactly the same. So, but we can also counsel the client on using proper foods to, to not exacerbate their condition. So if you were in Seattle and it was winter and it's cold and wet, you wouldn't want to be eating fruits because fruits are the coldest and wettest foods we have. So that would only exacerbate your condition. Mm. So we advise on the lifestyle in that way as well. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love, I love the, the way that you're tying in the environment, the macrocosmic to the microcosmic climates inside. And it, what a radical change that is from the Western model. And even in Western herbalism, which can be very reductionistic, which can say, well, this herb is good for all allergies. Um, no. And, no. <laughs> and I think, you know, for many herbalists, that's when you're like scratching your head, you're like, well, why aren't these herbs working? Well, if you don't have the energetics, right? Yes. You know? Yes. Well, there's, I can give you a, a number of examples. I actually more recently, um, I had a client, client come in with a digestive issue and uh, she had been to a naturopathic doctor and for a lung something to do with her lungs. And he gave her the herb coptis, uh, hung by it's coptitis in, in the Latin. And coptis is a very, is extremely cold, drying herb. And what happened is because the naturopathic physician, I'm sure he was doing his best, um, didn't understand the nature of the person who had the problem that made her system more cold and damp. Um, and so it damaged her digestion for which she came into me for. So what I had to do, of course, is tell her to stop using that herb. <laughs> and it, we would never in Eastern medicine, unless there was, it, it would be very unusual to use an herb singly. We always use them in combination to moderate the effects of the main herb or the main um, point of the of the treatment. So coptis, which is very cold, is very good for eliminating or helping to eliminate um, infections and so forth. But it can be very damaging to a person's system, especially their digestive system. So we would add other herbs in there to protect the other systems. Because when you treat the lungs, you're not just treating the lungs, you're influencing all these other systems in the body. And you can't, we're not like a machine where you just can take out one piece and, and fix it and put it back in. It doesn't work that way. All these organ systems talk to each other constantly. They interrelate, they, inter, they intermesh, and uh, they, they, they have a relationship. So by doing, by treating just one piece, and not allowing for what the context, the rest of the context is, the person who has the problem, we are actually doing them a disservice. Mm -hmm. Think of it this way. Think of a, of a symphony, a symphony orchestra. You have the string section, you have the percussion section, you have the wind section, you have the horn section. So you have all these sections. Well, all of a sudden, this one violinist over here starts playing off key. So they, so the person goes to the doctor and says, well, my violin is off key over here. What do I do? And they say, here, take this medication, which then only suppresses the violinist. It doesn't remove or correct the violinist, right? So the, here's the violinist is still playing off key. So the symphony is no longer or the music is no longer sounding as much like a symphony as it should. Well, pretty soon the guy next to him gets aggravated and he starts playing off key. And then that spreads. That just spreads. And with the medication, because all this is suppressed. And so we can hear it, but barely. It starts spreading. It's allowed to, to, to expand into the rest of the orchestra. And before you know it, the whole string section is playing off key and we no longer have a symphony. And by then you have a disease pattern. 
So Western medicine can go in and further suppress the string part of the orchestra, or they can actually go in and remove it. Well, then it's not an orchestra anymore. Mm. <laughs> what has happened? There's, there's no interconnection. There's no music playing. There's no symphony. Where's the harmony? It's gone. Mm. So, but with herbal medicine, we can go in and say, um, hey, violinist, we, we, we need for you to get back on track. And here's, here's, the, here's the blueprint of how to do that. And so we, we gently go in and get this violinist to play on key again, rather than suppressing it and having it insidiously spread. Mm -hmm. And that insidious spreading can go over weeks, months, decades before it's recognized as the original problem. Wow. That's such a beautiful example. I love that, that metaphor of the, of the orchestra. And, you know, I think too, and, and just the environment, you know, if you have a garden and if you let, you know, if something gets out of whack, you know, in your garden, it, you know, you'll start to see that, you know, whether it's like an aphid, you know, aphids are coming because the soil isn't rich enough or whatever it might be, how that it will start to slowly spread. And then the whole garden gets affected, even though it just started in one small corner. Exactly. Um, and I had this, and I don't know if if I'm, if I'm making this up, but, but in physics, isn't there something like the string theory about how everything is connected? And if you pull one thing, then everything is pulled. In yeah, there is, there is, <laughs> there, there is that. That's about that's, is all that's I know. The entanglement. That's, that's the entanglement. The okay. Yeah. That's the concept of entanglement that once you are connected with something, you're forever connected with them, even though you might be on the other side of the planet. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting because, um, you know, my husband did a lot of work with um, shamanic medicine in the Amazon and they, the, the shamans he worked with in Peru said that, you know, once you do a plant diet or a dieta, that that plant is with you for your whole life. So mm -hmm. all you, you know, if you take ayahuasca or datura, like you can just simply call upon the memory of that plant and it will then be in your body again, or it, like it, you can call upon its medicines. Mm -hmm. So that's, that seems like something that, you know, again, this is a very ancient tradition of medicine that they were also connected to this idea of entanglement. Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and a lot of that is missing, of course, from our Western thinking. And it makes so, it so boring, doesn't it? <laughs> it's like, you know, well, it's, the, it's, the magic and the wonder and, you know, the complexity of, of these ways of thinking it's exciting to live in it's, that kind of a world, isn't it? Oh, to me, yeah, it really makes you think. It really um, gets you thinking about all kinds of connections and, and interconnections and interrelations and, and inter-influencings. Um, it, to me, it's, it's very stimulating. And I, a linear thinking, I, believe me, I know how to do that. I, I learned that really well <laughs> in my my beginning years, but there's, there's a limit and, um, and we need to, well, it's not actually how the world works. The world does not work linearly. It never has, and it never will because the world is made up of all these living systems. And when you're dealing with a living system, you have to do process thinking. You have to do systems thinking in order to work with it. Mm. Because if you dissect it, you, di you destroy it. Mm. It's no wow. longer a living system. Everything about it, the spark that made it what it was is gone. So even dissecting herbs to find out what the little pieces are, the chemical constituents, to me, you're, you're destroying the synergistic capability of that herb by taking things out of context. You must have respect for the context. The person who has the illness is the context. We don't treat disease in Eastern medicine. We never treat disease in Eastern medicine. We always treat the person who has the condition, never the, the disease itself. So people ask me all the time, can you treat this disease or that disease? And I said, well, I don't have enough information. 
I know what the disease is, but how is it manifesting in that particular person? And how is that person responding to that, to that stimulus of the disease? So we need to have that information. And Eastern medicine is all about that, all about the context. You must have the context. And Western herbal medicine, one of the reasons that one of the, the main piece that was missing for me was acknowledging the context and understanding the context, never mind so much the disease. We need to know who we're dealing with, dealing with and how many violinists are out of tune in that particular person. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really good point. Now I wanted to ask you, you know, in your book, um, you, you spend quite a bit of time talking about the history of Western herbal medicine, um, but, and how at one time it did include artistic process thinking, um, mm -hmm. understanding, and, you, you know, it included poetry and this larger cause cos cosmology, um, you, in your book, you talk a lot about linear versus nonlinear thinking and, and how this, you know, this juxtaposition has influenced modern herbal medicine in the West. I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about this linear versus nonlinear thinking and the effects that these two different ways of thinking have on us as herbalists. Well, um, I believe that Western herbal medicine, like you had mentioned earlier, um, did originally have the theory of humors, which gave it some kind of methodology to work with. Um, and the humors, remember, are all about the context, the person who has the issue. So, um, but when Western medicine came along when this, with its linear thinking, which is, by the way, much easier to do than process thinking, <laughs> um, when it came along with this very simplistic thinking, then Western medicine went along with that to make it more acceptable to um, the Western, the, the developing linear thinking Western mind to, to make it more acceptable. Mm. So I think we lost that um, because of that. So now we have Western herbal medicine, which treats symptoms, in my opinion, um, uh, at least the classic Western herbal medicine person. I'm not saying everyone because there's so many different kinds of herbal medicine in the West. Um, so classic Western herbal medicine is very linear in its thinking and very, and it does treat symptoms. So it doesn't take into consideration like this naturopathic doctor, the context. And on the other hand, where Western medicine treat Western herbal medicine treats or Western medicine even treats symptoms. We of Eastern medicine, we work with systems. So, so symptoms to systems. Yeah. <laughs> so um, linear thinking is very simplistic. It's, it's, it's overly simplistic and it's not what the world is about. It never was. Hmm. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it is nice to see that there are more schools adding in things like energetics, like Matthew Wood's work has been mm -hmm. so positively influential on Western herbalists, really bringing back the humors and the six tissue states and um, a lot of that a lot of those concepts. Um, Cause I know for me, when I graduated from herb school, it was a very Western based science heavy program. And I left being like, but wait, yeah. Like what <laughs> I'm missing something here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. As a yoga teacher exactly. myself, you know, I was, you know, be, having, a, you know, as a person that meditates and thinks in, in a more systems way, um, that, that's just part of what yoga trains your mind to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I definitely was like seeking out and, uh, you know, thankfully, yeah, I think I was able to unearth some of these older energetic systems because I did, you'll, you'll, you'll laugh at this. Um, I did one, one day I was like, I'm going to study Ayurveda because I'm a yoga teacher and I'm going to study Ayurveda. So I bought Dr. Vasant Lod's like three, um, Ayurvedic textbooks, like the, yeah. and mm -hmm. I started reading one and I think I got maybe two chapters in and I go, okay, no, <laughs> <laughs> this, 
this is so complex and, and so detailed. Like this is a whole, this could be a lifetime of study in itself. It's not something you can just pick up on a weekend and say, I, I do Ayurveda. I mean, it is <laughs> so complex. Um, it, <laughs> so it, it's complex, but it's so beautiful at the same time. It's just like a symphony when you add in all those pieces and they are all harmonized together. You get a beautiful piece of music. Yeah. So, um, but Ayurveda is all about that harmony, all about, and so is um, classical Chinese medicine. Yeah. And I wanted to you to tell a little bit about, because you studied both and like, that's pretty Mm -hmm. amazing um, to have, you know, a real deep understanding, which is so clear in your book, the way that you describe everything just so beautifully. So what are the similarities? Like what, what did you see as, as the related factors um, between these two systems of medicine? Um, everything. <laughs> everything from the five elements, which is in Ayurveda, um, I think more refined. And in Chinese medicine, it's a little bit more vague to me, but they can be correlated. Um, and even in the description of the doshas and, and yin and yang, that can also be correlated. I do that in my book. I'm sure you've seen that. Yes. I have all the charts that describe all of that. Um, but it, but basically the language is different, but the concepts are exactly the same. They, as I was saying, um, I feel in Ayurveda the, the five elements or the five phases I call it are more more um, easily understandable. So I talk about that in detail. Uh, from the Ayurvedic standpoint in my book. And then, um, and, but in classical Chinese medicine, the formulations, uh, the ancient formulations that they have and some of the new ones even, are so beautifully put together. They're like poetry in themselves. <laughs> and they're just, they're works of art on how they, and they explain in some of the books that I cite, in my um, book, uh, how these are all put together and why they're there, why these other herbs are added in and, and how you can modify them. And, and Chinese medicine has, a, it, it, they've, they've brought it to an art, um, at least in, in making formulations, herbal formulations. It's truly a beautiful art and, and deserves to be studied. Um, but I explained some of that in my book as well, and, and also provide charts as to the, you call it energetics, I call it functional principles, um, um, how you can build a formula for a particular person who has the condition that you're trying to work with. Mm, so that's brilliant, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, so to me, to me, the, I, I'm, I'm a systems thinker. I have, um, I have no problem studying two seemingly diverse uh, modalities at the same time. And I do that all the time on my, on my coffee table. I have so-called coffee. I don't drink coffee, but <laughs> on my coffee table, I have all these books um, um, from Sadhguru to, to quantum physics and everything in between. Um, I just love studying a whole diverse, and and each one of them adds more um, to my understanding of the world and how it works, understanding of people and who they are and how they manifest certain things. Um, It's 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 definitely brought a lot of enlightenment to my life. And I'm sure to your, yeah, and to your clients' lives as well. I mean, this is, you've really taken on such depth in your studies and it really shines in your book. It's, it's really a marvelous piece. So for those of you, you. we'll tell you how to, how to find this book at the end, but before we leave, uh, I wanted to end with one of the poems you wrote that really struck a chord with me from your book. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's called herbs, green physicians, mighty messengers of life rooting their wisdom into our bodily turf. Verdant offerings remember us to mend with gentleness, compassion, bring us to blossom end. From seed to flower, 
all a banquet of power to grow the planted memory of our nature divinity. Oh, I just, it's so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's such a wonderful weaving together of, of, yeah, the way that you see plants, the way that you believe plants work, the way that plants influence us, you know, in, in that reciprocal relationship. And, you know, your book too, um, I really loved how you have quotes kind of throughout the book. There was another quote that I pulled out that I really liked. Um, let's see if I can find it. It was one on, oh, here it was. It was a quote by physicist um, Paul Durack. Mm -hmm. It is more important to have beauty in one's equations than to have them fit the experiment. It is more important to have beauty in one's equations than to have them fit the experiment. And this is a physicist speaking. So that, that in itself, that line in itself, that quote is, is very poetic. And that's what I'm saying. These physicists have, they, they have come to understand that our, our, our lives, our nature, our world, our universe is very poetic. And it can't be described linearly. It has to be described systematically or mm. systemically, sorry. Yeah. So, um, but I feel that physicists have, or many physicists, not all, some of them get to that threshold and they just can't go any further because <laughs> they're just, they, after that, it does, it's no longer science, it's something else. And they don't want to go there. But um, I feel that a lot of physicists are, um, in, through the experiments that they do and have seen, um, and the implications of that, have, have come to um, understand what harmony is. And, and they have this intuitive sense of rightness about things. And, and frankly, most physicists, most scientists, um, most of their theories come from intuition first hmm. and then they take and that was the case with Einstein as well um, and then they take that and then try to ground it in science to make sure that it really is real and I think that's really important for the herbalist to remember is that you need to be grounded in maybe not the detailed science, but you need to make sure that what you're doing for that client is grounded in, in um, more, more than that intuitive sense of rightness, um, but into the science and, and have that methodology that tells you, yes, you got the principles right. You're now moving into the strategies, which then point to the herbal medicine. And that's actually how I teach my students. They don't even begin to learn about the herbal medicine for a year. They have to learn all the principles first, the strategies on how we do it and how we apply those principles, which then tell us how to use the herbs. Mm -hmm. And then, then we study the herbs. So we're, we're systems thinkers first, we're, we're principle, uh, we, we, we're strategists before we become herbalists. And, and that's the methodology. That's the beauty of Eastern medicine is it, it has this flow, this poetic flow, if you will, from, from the very beginning of meeting that client all the way through to the correct herbal formulations mm. that you would use. And hopefully your client shifts so that the next time you see your client, don't expect the same thing that if you did your job, they will be different. So again, you have to reevaluate that context because now the music is different. Mm. So music is better. It's more in harmony. So what do we need to tweak to get that music to become a symphony? Mm. Oh, I love that. That's so beautiful. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you so much, Dr. Judith, for joining, for having this chat with me. And, and uh, let's tell our listeners, where can they find this book? Where can they get their hands on this so that they can read the poetry of the universe and the plants as well? Well, you can um, order it on my website, which is www.judithshamash.com. 
judyshamo.com. That's J-U-D-Y-T-H-S-H-A-M-O-S-H.com. Um, you can, so you can order it there. Um, you can also order it on my pub- publisher site, which is purecarbonpublishing.com. And the um, Ingram site, uh, which is another, um, is the printers. Um, so you can order directly from them. Um, if you order from me, I will send you a signed copy. So that's one, <laughs> one advantage. Um, and if you do order the book, um, I, I, I can guarantee you will be enlightened. It will expand your knowledge of herbal medicine and how to use it and in ways you never thought possible. Mm, beautiful. <laughs> in, ways, in ways that will help your clients truly heal instead of just quieting that out of tune violinist. <laughs> mm-hmm. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And I'll make sure to include all the links um, in this talk so that people can find direct links to your website, to your book and to your publisher so that they can find it in multiple different ways. Thank you. And and find you too, because you teach. So if you have questions or you want to study with Dr. Judith, then you can also find her that way as well. Yes, absolutely. And please, um, if you read the book and um, you have any comments or questions, feel free to email me. You can email me on that same website, uh, judithshamash.com. I would love to hear from you. And I'd also love to hear what you're doing. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you again. It was a pleasure chatting with you. Actually, it was a delight. All right. Take good care. Thank you.